Greetings to all in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I'm facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found on the list of study groups on the LNL research page uh, shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook uh, under Seattle Law of One study group. We do meet online on Zoom on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time as well as Saturday from 7.30 to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, that would be probably late afternoon for folks who are living in European uh, time zones or West Asian time zones. You don't have to live in Seattle to join our Facebook group or to join our Zoom sessions. Anyone who's interested and available at those times is welcome to join us. We do also have a YouTube channel where you can go to find recordings of previous Q&A sessions with Jim and with other members of the LNL. Uh, research channeling team and all are invited to uh, watch and learn and enjoy. Otherwise today we are blessed to be joined again by Jim McCarty for some informal conversation and some questions and answers about the law of one and how to live it in our daily lives. How are you doing today Jim? Doing well, doing well. How about you John? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking. How's the uh, weather in Louisville these days? Well it's pretty decent. It's uh, highs in the 50s, lows in the 30s. So that's better than it's been. You know, we had some chilly weather earlier. Have you gotten much snow? No, we had an inch of snow. That's all we've gotten so far. Hmm. Yes. Yeah, it has been cold in Seattle when we got our first snowfall a few days ago and it's still on the ground. So it's kind of a nice welcome site for uh, uh, folks who love winter and love Christmas time. Hey, I wanted to uh, ask you, first of all, about the public channeling session. The word is on the street that uh, you had a, a public channeling session about a week ago. How did it uh, go? It went very well. Uh, it was unusual in that uh, I didn't know most of the people that were there. Uh, they had been, at, many of them had been at the coming home gathering in Asheville, North Carolina, previous uh, September. And when they heard that we were going to have our public channelings again, they signed up to come because uh, we only have room for 15 people. And we're now inviting our channeling circle channels that have been working on channeling for the last seven years to come and channel publicly for the first time. And so that means uh, with 15 seats here, five of them could be channels, so there would only be 10 for folks from uh, outside of the group. So uh, there is uh, a sign up app that you can get uh, if you go to contact at llresearch.org. Uh, Trisha Bean has found this app that lets people sign up in advance to whatever openings are at that time available. So uh, that's the way we're doing it. This is the that was our first channeling in two and a half years since the COVID began. Wow, that must have been something, yeah. So uh, did it feel different for you uh, doing it uh, now, public channeling after two years away? Not really different. It was just, it was unusual in that uh, I only knew two or three of the people that were there. And uh, that's, that's unusual. I imagine that uh, for a while that'll probably continue because a lot of people heard about us through the Asheville Coming Home group. And uh, so we'll probably get some of those from uh, time to time. But uh, it's good to see everybody. We, uh, by the time the session was over, we all felt like we knew each other pretty well. We always start with a round robin, which was Carla's way of uh, letting people, as some people call it a check-in. Uh, just, you know, about five minutes tell about uh, who you are, where you're from, where you found the law of one and, and what's happening in your spiritual journey here of late. It's important to you. So by the time we go around and everybody's done that, then you know people a little bit better. And it also gives us a framework or a platform on which those of Quo can um, use this familiarity and the uh, joining together of hearts that have just been shared as a means for giving information that can be of a higher nature than if we didn't know each other, if we didn't go through a round robin and share uh, our spiritual journeys uh, via our hearts. Wow, what a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for doing that and to uh, all the folks on the channel and team. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, I think, with uh, Austin and Gary and Trish uh, last time we had a session. And 
Yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, it, <laughs> it must be stressful enough just channeling, period. Uh, channeling in front of friends and yeah. people you know would be another thing, and then channeling in front of folks that you've never met before. I Un unfortunately, uh, Gary and Austin and Kathy Beck could not come to channel because Gary and Kathy Beck's daughter, who lives with her, came down with COVID. <sighs> so it was just Austin and I doing the channeling last Saturday. So it was a, a, a little different. Uh, Actually, that's usually the way things were done when Carla and I were here. You know, Carla would uh, channel and I would channel, so it would be two channels. So it really is the traditional way for l, &L. It's something quite new for, for more than two people. And hopefully that'll happen uh, a week from today. Two wow, channels. that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, someone in the chat window was asking about what is the site for public group channeling and for signing up to join? And just wanted to repeat what Jim said. The best way, if you want to attend a public channeling session, would be to contact LNL Research through their uh, email, which is contact at llresearch.org. I just put it in the chat window. And if you go to the LNL Research page, just click on contact and you'll see it there. Uh, otherwise, uh, yes, that is wonderful. Thank you so much for, for doing that. That is just a tremendous uh, service to others and looking forward to uh, more of those in the future. Uh, I do see a few questions in the chat window and I would encourage folks who are on the Zoom call right now, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, uh, go ahead, put them in the chat window just to let me know and we will probably go through them in order. Uh, otherwise, uh, Jim, I did want to ask you about something uh, that you wrote about in the Camelot Journal. It was a few days ago. I think it was on Tuesday. You were writing about, uh, well, I should ask first, uh, you're on chapter eight of the Living, uh, the Law of One uh, 102 book on the how to work, which I believe you said is the last chapter in the book. Is that correct? The last chapter, and today is the last entry in that chapter. Tomorrow, I'll begin Law of One 103, The Inner Work. Oh, that's wonderful. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah, what's uh, what's next? Wow. So you'll take pretty much the same approach to that book as this book? I mean, in the journal? Right. right, yeah. Um, what I've been trying to do with 102, and I'll try that with 103 as well, is uh, I wrote these first drafts um, a year or two ago. And um, as I go through them now, I see that there's some areas that could benefit from elaboration of the concept being discussed. So I usually try to find more quotes, uh, most usually from Quo and occasionally from Ra, that uh, substantiate what's being said, but maybe give a little different angle on it, uh, expand in some manner that you know, increases, hopefully increases people's understanding of what's being talked about. So I'll be doing that again uh, with 103. And um, that'll start tomorrow. That's so wonderful to hear. Yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Love seeing the blend of uh, quotes from Quo as well as Ra and your reflections, interpretations on them, and stories from your own personal life, how they uh, have applied to you. It's really just such a great teach learning for, for all of us. Appreciate it. I did want to ask about that one particular entry. Uh, it was fascinating to me where, um, you were talking about chapter eight and the section on this exists in every part of the creation. And you did cite a uh, passage from the raw contact where it was session 88 in question 33, where Ra said, much of what you call creation has separated from the one logos of this octave and resides within the one infinite creator. Communication in such an environment is the communication of cells of the body that which is learned by one is known to all. And this was in reference to the uh, experiment, for lack of a better word, that uh, they did with the veil of forgetting. Um, it was really fascinating to me, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit uh, about that, um, your understanding, interpretation of that for folks who didn't read that entry. Well, we have not always had a veil of forgetting between our conscience and subconscious minds. Back at the beginning of the uh, creation, the third density entities did not have a veil. They all saw each other as being the creator. And there was no doubt about that at all. It was like an umbilical cord was uh, fastened onto each one and no one was more the creator than any other the creator. So 
knowledge, knowledge of that sort would seem to be you know, very inspirational and just the way to be. However, there was no reason in their own minds to learn uh, from love or fear because all was the creator. And they had to repeat the third density time after time. And it was a very slow process. They knew that part of the process of polarization and graduation was the way it worked, but still there was no reason. So eventually there was the discovery by uh, one of the Logoi that if the conscious and subconscious minds were separated by a veil of forgetting, that paradoxically, it would speed the process of evolution because they would not have this knowledge of the creator within them. Subconsciously, that knowledge would still be there. So that yearning to know more and to grow would be there. But since they did not see everyone as the creator, then there were problems with miscommunication. But the problem with miscommunication was that then they could work upon the communication and become more aware of how to communicate and learn and grow and polarize their consciousness. So the process of evolving through the third density was speeded up tremendously by putting this veil of forgetting in and this knowledge of being able to do that and its positive benefits for polarization then spread throughout the creation, as Ra said, that uh, you know, the various logoi are uh, connected with each other so that it's like cells of the body communicating with each other. So that knowledge of the veil and its uh, ability to enhance the evolutionary process became immediately known to the rest of the creation. And the polarization then became more efficient. And we, we are there now with that veil of forgetting. Yeah, the communication part was the part that was most fascinating to me. Am, am I remembering correctly that the veil, if we picture a logos as like a spiral galaxy, was the veil experiment started on the outer part of the galaxy or at the center? Well, as far as we can tell, it was in the center. And then as uh, I think Ra later used an a analogy of a flower strewn field, uh, growing and spreading throughout the creation, that it spread rapidly in that way. But it was at the, the very first portion of the creation um, where it began, that it didn't take long to include the entire creation. That is so fascinating to me. I know um, as uh, one who's studied a little bit about quantum physics, there does seem to be kind of a parallel in quantum physics, they talk about quantum entanglement and these ideas that it would appear that uh, if you measure the condition or state of one electron, it can change the condition or state of an electron that's like light years away. <laughs> they really don't have an explanation for it, but somehow, yeah, there is this form of communication, this connection that can go from one end of the universe to, to the other. They haven't figured out how that it's works. It's pretty amazing when you consider the universe is infinite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's no end to it. <laughs> you know, no, apparently not. But as Ra said, when when we begin to understand infinity, we'll begin to understand the law of one, right? Um, and that does remind me uh, also that uh, you kind of tied that in with the calling. I think there was a passage where they talked about uh, the doubling effect in calling and when enough individuals on earth are sending out a call for help and sorrow and anguish that it spreads to the limits of the creation as well, right? Right. Yeah. It's heard to the limits of creation, just exactly what Ross said. Yeah. So beautiful. Do you think this has a uh, uh, implication for developing social memory complexes? the idea that that which is learned by one is known to all. Do you think that could be part of our evolution into a social memory complex where somehow we are all connected by thoughts and experiences? I believe it potentially is possible. Uh, I think that, and now again, I'm always giving you my own opinion and I could be wrong and in my interpretations of raw, but 
where you have people that are opening their hearts in unconditional love, realizing as conscious seekers of truth that this is the way we all progress here on earth, that a potential social memory complex is then starting to be formed so that those who are aware of how the graduation occurs are some of the first entities to begin that process. And they may not do it in a conscious manner, but subconsciously and together as groups, they can become more efficient in their own polarization, which then can become an example uh, to others to do the same. Uh, in our culture here on earth, we have a lot of problems, a lot of uh, calling, you might say. I mean, the brothers and sisters of sorrow undoubtedly are hearing the great sorrow on planet earth now because there is so much uh, difficulty and anger and separation and confusion uh, and faction against faction and uh, seeming uh, unwillingness to have any kind of an open heart. And this is actually what can form a call so that in some fashion, there could be a response to that call. Most generally, uh, as far as I understand it, there are planets, uh, planetary minds, uh, that send love and light uh, indiscriminately to everybody on planet Earth so that they are available uh, to receive this. Uh, the entire creation is made out of love. As uh, Ra mentioned, the creator decided to know itself. And so that free will choice uh, manifested in the various logoi that you can see as love having the ability to create the creation as the free will of the creator focused through that love and created light light being photons vibrating at various angles and speeds of rotation and creating what we call physical matter so the entire creation is made out of love and light and by having various planetary entities send love and light it enhances what's already here and hopefully could begin to move into those areas of people who have uh, difficulty in feeling love for each other. Uh, and that's the great hope is that eventually this could occur so that a social memory complex of a larger nature could be formed. Uh, right now, Roz, well, right now, uh, back in the early 80s, <laughs> Uh, Ra's uh, thought was that it did not look like the harvest uh, was going to be very large. That most people would have to repeat the third density on another planet. But we're, we're hoping that uh, what they said in 6512, could your planet polarize positively in one fine, strong moment of inspiration? Yes, my friends, it is not probable, but it's ever possible. So that is the hope. Indeed. Yes, thank you for that reminder. It's always been one of my favorite passages as well. I had one follow-up question on that uh, before we go to the chat window uh, on the subject of social memory complexes. Do you think, would it be fair to say in, in your opinion that our higher self at sixth density is or has been part of one or more social memory complexes? Well, as best as I understand what Ra had to say about the nature of our higher self, our higher self has what you could call a roadmap of all the potential paths we could take in forming a social memory complex. Now, Ra never said that our higher self had ever been part of a social memory complex, but it seems possible that if the potential path of every seeker includes the path being in a social memory complex, that this would be possible for the higher self to have already done that. There is also what Ra called the mind-body-spirit complex totality, which is what you could say the higher self's higher self. And that mind-body-spirit complex totality exists in the seventh density, the density of foreverness. Ra did say that we, and our higher selves and our mind body spirit complex totalities are three points in a circle all are the same entity so i think this gets into the area of the eternal present 
which seems to be a very um, interesting type of concept that exists outside of third density. In third density, we have past, present, and future. And outside of that, there is the eternal present, where apparently all things are happening at once. So uh, <laughs> you can see how the mind boggles a bit in trying to figure out how that all works, since we're also going through the densities of this octave as our journey back into unity with the one creator. And that eventually at the end of that journey, the end of the seventh density of foreverness, in the eighth density, uh, there is a, a coalition, a coalescing of all entities and things to help the creator know itself. And that is the completion of the density. And yet it's also the beginning of the next octave and everything starts again. Right, and apparently goes on for infinity. <laughs> right, as Ross said, it all begins and ends in mystery. Uh, yeah, that's I love what it when we're Paul right. says that we really don't know what's ahead either. It's, as, far, as far as we can see, it just continues, the mystery continues into infinity. Our, our minds, I don't believe, can easily comprehend some of those concepts, so we just to have the faith and the will that all of this works as it's supposed to, as it always has. For sure. I was only asking because I was under the impression that uh, graduating and then evolving to fourth and then fifth and then sixth density pretty much necessitates becoming part of a social memory complex. Is right. that not the case? Are there individuals who go from fourth to fifth to sixth density never being part of a social memory complex? Only the negatively oriented entities do that. All positive entities form social memory complexes. And then the social memory complex has the memory of every person's incarnation, all the memories of all incarnations as a huge library of information to use as they continue to serve others. Their uh, social memory complexes of a positive nature um, are able to continue their polarization by being of service to others, such as entities on planets like Earth. And that's kind of what I was curious about, what I was wondering about, if if in fact we are part of social memory complexes and fourth, fifth, sixth densities, could be from other planets, could be from Earth, it could be that our higher self is actually part of a social memory complex of Earth's social memory complex in the future. Is that possible? It's, I think it's possible. I couldn't say if that's the way it is, though. Yeah. Well, someday when we get to the density of understanding, <laughs> maybe we will. Yeah. Thank you so much for entertaining my uh, long, strange trains of thoughts. And thank you to all who've been waiting to ask questions in the chat window. Uh, let's go ahead straight to Bill Deming. I believe you have a question there. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask Bill? Yeah, um, mine's about uh, free will, the law of confusion. Now, uh, this is going to take a little explaining. Oh, pardon me. Um, the Confederation goes to a great length of protecting free will. You know, you see many sessions where uh, people answer, ask individual questions about themselves, and the uh, QO or whatever says we can't say that violates free will. And uh, we know obviously that from fourth density and above, uh, negative and positive, that uh, because of there, there's no veil. They have knowledge, experience that uh, violation of free will is very easy to do. Now, my question kind of pertains to third density entities violating other third density entities' free will. I know. So you got to the extreme where somebody is like uh, killing or murdering. The, well, that's obviously kind of a violation of free will because the entity is taken out of the incarnation even though the offender would not know about third density and the law of one and stuff like that. And then you have people talking about healing, saying that a third density entity that is healing somebody else, uh, other third density entity without their permission or acceptance is a violation of their free will. Even though the entity being healed won't be healed unless they want to heal. And then, um, and then I'll give you another example of proselytizing. Okay, if I go around like door to door going, you know, hey, I'm a, I'm here to talk about the law of one. Do you want to hear the message and stuff like that? I mean, 
is like missionaries do, um, would that be a, a, a violation of free will? Because, you know, in that case, any kind of proselytizing would be a violation of free will. And then uh, we'll get to an example of just yourself, Jim. Um, you have all this knowledge, all this experience. You've done tons of metaphysical work, uh, but you still exist in third density, and you you still have the veil, and you still operate on faith. You know everything that we're believing and doing has to be based on faith. And I, and and even in the literature, uh, I, it said the Confederation said like you're a wanderer. So I mean I, that I've I've read that. So so you're you know got all this previous life. Ex I mean experience. And then uh, and then I know in between this, uh, you get so much knowledge. That the law of responsibility kind of kicks in. But, you know, the law of responsibility is just, uh, you know, once you learn uh, to the best of a person's ability, um, you know, in the life pattern, you know, you're, uh, you, you reveal love to self, love to others, and uh, love for self and love to others. And so my, my question basically is, uh, can a third person, can a third density person violate another third density entity's free will, really, I mean, in, in regards to the veil and faith and everything, um, or is it just catalyst, or is it all catalyst? Because uh, to me, I, I can't really see a third density entity being able to violate another third density's in, uh, free will because of the restraints we have on us in third density. So I'm just asking your opinion about that. Sorry for taking so long for the explanation. That's okay. Um, my thoughts are that in the third density, we all have the ability to behave however we choose. Usually it's a factor that is resulting from our pre-incarnative choices and how we want to use catalyst. So, the concept of and violating anyone's free will doesn't really seem to hold sway for our day-to-day -day interactions, that this is the way we work, uh, that our pre-incarnative choices are um, given to us through our subconscious minds that bias the way we see the world around us, so we will hopefully utilize our pre-incarnative choices. So in that respect, I don't think it's really possible to spiritually uh, violate another person's free will. Um, I think uh, what you had to say about healing, though, is interesting. Uh, I don't think, uh, Ra mentioned that it is only the person to be healed that actually accepts the healing. Another person can attempt to offer the healing, but what they're really doing is uh, breaking that protective shell that's formed by the red and violet rays around each person and it holds their state of health or disease in place. And when the healer is able to interrupt that momentarily, and if the healing is appropriate according to the higher self of that person, and the person wishes the healing, then the healing occurs. And the healer then reintegrates that protective shell to hold that new state of health in place. So uh, that would not be uh, a violation of free will to offer that because the healer actually doesn't do the healing. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but I don't think we can violate each other's free will. We can violate each other's rights. You know, I mean, we have laws against that. We have moral judgments that say we shouldn't be treating people this way. But people do what they do, and uh, most of it is having to process catalyst. And most people don't know that. They're just angry or uh, jealous or confused or uh, giving poor information for one reason or another. And it's just the way it works in third density. So each of us, as conscious spiritual seekers of truth, need to be able to sort through all of this and untangle it and see how it affects us personally 
so that we can use it as catalyst, as grist for the mill, food for our spiritual growth. Do you Did have you any follow up questions? Did you have a follow up uh, question, Phil? Oh, what about uh, the idea of proselytizing? That's just a catalyst as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, proselytizing, uh, you know, politicians proselytize for their point of view and, right. you know, board members for their point of view and mom and dad for their point of view and the employer for their point of view and employees for their point of view. You know, it's it's just a way of uh, re uh, relating to each other. Uh, if you're trying to change somebody's mind for some reason, uh, whether it's for your benefit or uh, belief you hold in a you know a, a religious uh, respect, uh, it, it's just people sharing their points of view, and we do that all the time. Yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Great questions indeed. Thank you for asking, Bill. Uh, Daniel Steinmetz, I know you've been waiting to ask a question for a while. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Sure. Um, yes. Good morning. Good morning, my time. Um, I've been so delighted to learn about the global meditations. I'd actually been looking for two or three years and uh, have found them very meaningful for me personally. So I wanted, but I haven't heard anybody talk about that in the few months that I've been with the discussion group. So I'm wondering, A, are the schedules still happening as they've been like on the website and so forth of the daily Gaia meditations? And I think there's a Saturday peace meditation for the duration of a conflict. And I'm curious if uh, LNL research people have anything to report about just how that is in their lives, what their experiences are. Uh, our Gaia meditation happens every evening uh, between six and seven o'clock, basically. And everyone's always in, uh, welcome to join. That's been going on for uh, almost 20 years now. Uh, the peace meditation that uh, began with the invasion of Ukraine uh, has not been mentioned on a, a website for some time. But we are sure that there's still people that are all over the world praying for peace and hoping that that uh, conflict can be brought to an end as soon as possible. Uh, so and I, I don't know if anybody has had any particular um, manifestation or realization in their own uh, use of the Gaia meditations or the peace meditation. I think that is sometimes what happens on an unconscious level. Um, that there is a response inside our being that is uh, reinforced every time we take part in any prayer for peace or any meditation for peace or any conscious effort to help there be peace between friends or neighbors or family. Uh, it is a process I think that has its chance to manifest in many different ways in our life patterns. And I think that would be unique for each person Another question, follow up? Well, my own personal guidance has been, my own inner approach has been to actually do a personal meditation until I'm really dialed in, however long that takes, and then to consciously join a web, join a network or something. So I actually get a, myself, I get a distinct sense of interconnectedness at a certain point and so i and so that would be a report from my world it's like there's something connected at that time that i experience but that's my own you know portion of the universe i'm experiencing i'm just wondering if there's been any uh anecdotal reports of how people personally have been experiencing that activity in their lives no, I'm not aware of any type of reports uh, at any level on our website or um, other websites. Uh, I think it would be a good thing uh, to just ask at some point. Uh, and I think your response is quite beautiful. I think that uh, you have a, a conscious awareness of what's going on with you that is uh, very uh, spiritually oriented. And I think uh, that hopefully would be the result for uh, many people as they do their meditations. Uh, 
as you did, you know, taking time to dial in and then begin the meditation after you feel that you're you're there where you want to be. It's a great question, Daniel. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, asking. Jim, do you think it would be fair to say that when people are doing the Gaia meditations that it's kind of adding to the calling to the brothers and sisters of sorrow to respond in the way that they do, including sending love and light? I think that's very likely. Uh, I think that not only uh, the uh, you know confederation or brothers and sisters of sorrow, but uh, there are other portions of our being, uh, our guides, the higher self, subconscious uh, mind, uh, those interplane entities that have been drawn to us by the nature of our seeking, that all can lend support to our own personal efforts at uh, meditating and praying for peace and sending the vibrations of love and light around the world and the healing vibrations as well. Uh, I think there are so many unseen entities that involved that it would be a, a beautiful uh, revelation if we were even aware of a small part of them. Indeed. Uh, I saw that uh, someone had a question about how to join the meditations <coughs> and uh, how do we join the meditation every day. I think <coughs> if I remember correctly, they're happening at 4 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time, which would be 7 o'clock Eastern Time. Does that right. Sound about right. Those are the times. If you want to, you know, gather together at those times, that would be great. Uh, but any time that you want to participate in the Gaia meditation, again, I think on the inner planes of the third density, that that eternal present is uh, holds sway, and that the, your effort at uh, meditating and achieving world peace uh, is added to everyone's effort. It doesn't matter what time you are doing it or anyone else. It's just that uh, a time schedule is a way of being sure that you're doing it at some point. Thank you. I did have a follow-up question on that, if you don't mind. Um, I, one of my favorite passages from a quote channel in the session was from November 13th, 2010, where Quo said, the ways of spirit are not the ways of humans. There is no measure for service. All services are equal. If you clean the bathroom with love in your heart, it is as much a service as if you heal or channel or teach with love in your heart. And indeed, if one who teaches or heals does not have love in her heart, you who clean the bathroom are serving more efficiently, more efficaciously, and to a higher degree of, of beauty. Along those lines, I guess I'm wondering if, uh, do you think it would be fair to say that on a metaphysical level, uh, someone who is cleaning bathrooms with love in their heart or just dancing to some really good music, rock music with love in their heart and thinking of maybe Mother Earth could be having perhaps more lightning effect uh, energies, lightning, lighting energy, <laughs> lightening energies for the Earth than someone who is actually meditating, but just kind of going through the motions without any real joy or love in their heart. I think that's very true. Uh, Ross said uh, that there is love in every moment. And that is the lesson of this density. And we know, as we were talking earlier, that the creator made the creation out of love. So it doesn't really matter what you do. It matters how you do it. If you do it with love in your heart, you're emphasizing and enhancing the love that is in every moment and in every person. And whether the person knows it or not, there is love that's more available to them around the world, all 8 billion souls have a chance to absorb or imbibe this love that is in every moment, which you're sending out consciously by doing what you do with love. So that's the key, consciously choosing to do it. And it doesn't matter what, it just matters that you do it with love. Thank you. Yeah, I was hoping that was the case. It seems that way and seems to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning as far as how that communication can go out to the entire creation. I, I see uh, Jasmine had her hand up and wanted to ask a follow-up question. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask Jasmine? Uh, sure, but it really wasn't a follow-up question. I had a different question. Um, I'm still relatively new here, and I've heard the term 
inner planes and inner planes being several times. Uh, Jim, can you just briefly explain what the inner planes are? Are they third or fourth density? And uh, a little bit about the entities that reside therein. Okay. Um, the inner planes can also be described as the metaphysical realms or the spiritual realms. And here on earth, we live in the physical realm. And when we drop our bodies and move through the uh, light that we will walk into, we are in the metaphysical or spiritual realms. So entities there do not have the veil of forgetting like we do here. They see the overall picture of a unitary universe, everybody being one, everybody being the creator. And they go back to their own soul identity at that point and have what's called the review of the incarnation to see if they were able to learn the lessons that they planned before the incarnation. If they weren't then again, with help of the guides and the higher self, they make further plans for the next incarnation. So the entities that reside in the metaphysical or spiritual realms are those who have a desire to enhance their own spiritual journeys, which they can do more easily within our third density illusion. And they then may choose to reincarnate with further lessons that will propel them along their spiritual path into hopefully the fourth density of love and understanding. Now the higher densities can also be seen as the same as the metaphysical or spiritual realm that we've been talking about here when we uh, leave our bodies and, and go through the light. Uh, so only here in the third density do we have that veil of forgetting that keeps us from seeing the overall picture of why we're here, and how we hope to progress on our spiritual journeys. Do you have any follow-up on, on that? Any follow-up questions on that, Jasmine? It appears not. Uh, I do see a couple of folks with their hands up, uh, Way Shower and Crystal. If you have follow-up questions to ask about something that we've just been talking about, would love to hear your questions. Uh, otherwise, I think there are folks who've been waiting in the chat window to ask questions that I wanted to get to first. Um, do you have follow-up questions to something we've been talking about just now? Uh, if so, feel free to unmute your mics and ask. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go back to the chat window and uh, let folks ask questions who've been waiting for a while. Um, my question was was just a new question because I was I was waiting to get in and I just wanted to I just posted my first question in the chat there, so mine's a, an initial question. Okay, uh, yep. do you mind waiting? And I'm sorry, I I did I re I took me a while to realize there were a lot. It's okay. Of yeah, no worries. Yeah, do do whatever's whatever's good. Thank you. Much appreciated. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe uh, 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 Rael had a question he wanted to ask a while ago. Rael, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Hey, Jim, how you doing? Miss doing you, well. Buddy. How are you doing? Good. Good, man. Good. Uh, I just wanted to ask. Um, I just wanted to ask you, like, what is the what was the race that uh, Yohan Chauvet made? Who, who was that? The Jews, or was that Anak, or who was that? I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, the race that Yoda and Chauvet made. Oh. Like, who was that? The uh, Anak, or was that the Jews, or who was that? Um, that was apparently. These were the transfer of the uh, people from the Red Planet. Uh, that uh, that uh, Yod, uh, Yahweh had genetically changed to help them better understand how to pursue the concept of love because they had had wars on the red planet on mars and destroyed their atmosphere so apparently these entities uh, did evolve into what we would call the jewish race and uh, another entity of a negative nature which appropriated the name yahweh uh, became their supposed god and they were the chosen people because that's the way the negative entities progress. 
And that Yahweh then uh, attempted to, uh, as all negative entities do, to use uh, the uh, Jewish people as a means of gaining an elite and then eventually conquering the earth. Uh, that did not work out for them because diaspora occurred and the Jewish people were scattered around the earth and became a much more humble and uh, loving entities as a result of diaspora. So um, that is basically a thumbnail sketch of the re relationship there. Uh, interestingly enough though, uh, those of Yahweh of the positive nature of the Confederation also, I don't know where that sound came from, that's pretty wild. Uh, they, uh, the uh, folks of uh, Yahweh of the positive nature also walked among the uh, entities from Mars while they were on earth. And if you're aware of the uh, book of Genesis in the Bible, where the uh, those of uh, the, those entities of Yahweh walked among the earth to uh, impregnate them and become able to give them greater ability to learn the laws of love. And this whole interaction when they did the cloning and then walking among them with a normal means of reproduction was decided by the Confederation to be an infringement on the free will of the entities from Mars. So that's when the uh, quarantine of planet Earth began 75,000 years ago at the beginning of the third density when the Mars entities were transferred here. So there were some repercussions from that that felt that uh, their free will of the Mars entities or the Jewish people had been infringed upon. Wow, thank you for that clarity. Thank you for that clarity, brother. <laughs> yeah. Did you have any uh, follow-up questions, Ron? It's good. Uh, Curtis, I believe you had a question. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hello, good evening, sorry, good afternoon, guys. Um, Jim, I have a question. When Ra were mind, body, spirit complexes, and I know, I understand we're supposed to meditate, pray or contemplate for our mind. Our body, I know he told Carla about eating food stuff. Have they got in more debt and debted with it with quo and stuff about the food stuff and exercise and sleep for our body? Um, the food stuffs that they suggested for Carla uh, were basically the grains and the vegetables and the fruits. And when she needed more uh, vitality for the body, they suggested she could eat some meat that was uh, high in um protein and did not have additives and uh, so forth to it. Uh, over the years though, uh, there has not been very much information regarding how the body should be exercised or how the food should be taken in. Um, basically, that seems to be a feature that is unique to each person. And each person can decide through, I guess, trial and error as what works best as far as foods and exercise. Um, a lot of exercise is determined by, you know, what kind of shape you're in now, how old you are. Uh, as I get older, I realize as a use it or lose it, I got to exercise or I will lose my ability to do exercises. So it, uh, we have not got a lot of information from Quo or La Lima or La Tui. Uh, concerning that, it's something that uh, each person has to make a decision for him or herself. Okay, they haven't mentioned anything about sleep also? Sleep eight hours a night, four hours a night? No, that also seems to be quite uh, unique for every person. Um, I meditate a fair amount during the day, so my, my sleep time is usually only four or five hours. Most people would probably do better to get uh, seven or eight hours, uh, that's just in general. But once again, uh, some people need more than that. Some people don't need that much. It, it's unique to each person. Okay. Uh, there was one thing I remember in the raw contact. It says something with mind and body, which would enable or ennoble your spirit. That's why I was trying to understand, was there a balance needed to be done with your mind and body to enable or ennoble your spirit? I'm not uh, recalling that quote right now. Uh, your mind, 
as actually uh, what creates the body. The body is a creature of the mind so that you can utilize the body as a reminder of catalysts that you have not utilized in the way that you would wish to before the incarnation began and you made your pre-incarnated choices. So sometimes when you don't become aware of catalysts that you need to use, it will be given to the body in a symbolic fashion, uh, having to do with uh, the area of the, the body or the area of the mind that has not been utilized. So that, uh, uh, well, back uh, during the raw contact, I had uh, a disharmonious moment with Don where I thought that his desire to want to publish all the books together at that point uh, was not a good idea because we didn't have the money to do it. And unfortunately, I, I got angry with him. The way I utilized that anger was uh, there was a couch that separated our living room to make it smaller for our meditation groups. So somebody uh, rang the doorbell. And I ran over and I, I hurdled the couch to demonstrate my anger. And I answered the door. Uh, that night, because I had let that catalyst go unhealed, I had not healed the disharmony that I created with Don, then there was a, a wood spider that bit me on the arm and caused my kidneys to malfunction. I had nephrotic syndrome for a few months and I gained about 30 pounds of water weight. So what happened was that that anger uh, was not utilized as catalyst. It was given to the section of my body that concerned one-to-one -one relationships to the, the orange ray energy center. And that was where my kidneys were located. So it, after I finally uh, did that healing and also had to take a few uh, chemicals, drugs, uh, Lasix to lose the water weight, uh, then the healing was complete. So uh, that's the closest I can come to how uh, the mind and the body can enhance the spirit. Uh, that was the way it worked for me. Thank you. Thank you. Great questions. Thank you so much. Uh, Wei Shower, I see you have your hand up. Are you asking a follow-up question to something we're talking about or a question on a different topic? You might have to unmute your mic to speak. Uh, not hearing you. I believe your mic is still muted. Sorry, my phone is doing this thing where the mute thing isn't showing up. Um, I just, I had a new question. I just still had my hand raised from before. So whenever new questions are coming around. Why don't you go ahead? I had one person ahead of you, but uh, I'll come back to him after. Your okay, perfect. Perfect timing, actually. Um, uh, so uh, my question was um, for you, Jim. And hello, Jim. Good to see you. I'm glad I've been able to make it. I, uh, I have been having a hard time catching these calls, so I'm glad I'm here. Um, my question is um, around, um, like, I, I've been experiencing, um, like, buildup of energy in my solar plexus, and um, I can attribute it, you know, there's definitely thoughts and unprocessed things that I know that need to, to be dealt with. But I, I, I've come to understand that I just, as a human being, I tend to have a lot of energy that's processing through me. And when I'm not, when it's not going all the way through, it gets stuck. And anger is typically the thing that it turns into for me. Um, and it seems to be around my solar plexus. And so I'm just curious if you have any um, thoughts on um, you know, um, the, the meditation or contemplation that would be good to, to help unravel, you know, specific distortions around a particular sh chakra. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, solar plexus is the main one for me, um, at the moment, cause that's where I'm feeling it. And I'm just curious what you, what your thoughts might be on that. Well, the solar plexus is usually related to uh, group interaction. So mm -hmm. if you feel a lot of energy there, uh, and you think that it might be disharmonious, uh, it would probably be helpful if you looked at uh, what groups you're uh, working with, and if there have been any difficulties, any miscommunications or disharmonies, 
And then in your meditation, if you could look at whatever you find in the way of those disharmonies or miscommunications and balance them as Ross suggested, uh, looking at them as how they happen, remembering them and then intensifying the experience so that it's very large and outrageously large. And then just for the moment, imaging the opposite and then let that image of the opposite get as large in your mind as the beginning anger was and then accept yourself for having both of those as a way for the creator to know itself through you and for you to know yourself and the creator in the other person as well so that you turn that uh, anger into uh, food for growth that's what the catalyst on earth is meant to be help us all learn how to grow by interacting with each other and whenever we see that our uh, being has been knocked off of its normal love center where we feel love then we use the catalyst that knocked it off to get back to that love by the process of balancing Did you have any follow-up questions to that uh, way shower? I had to mute your mic because there was some background. Noise. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think that sounds sounds good. Do you think that, just a quick one, uh, do you think that um, distortion could be as a result of that energy needing to channel through a particular medium in regards to groups and because it's not doing that, getting stuck, does that make sense? Or is it, or is it usually distortion as a result of some, you know, um, like, con like conscious uh, trauma or, uh, you know, uh, distorted mental process around it? Yeah, I think the latter is usually the case that uh, it's a, a normal process of people interacting with each other and being what Ra called mirrors for each other. So that you see in the other person that quality that you do not accept in yourself and by looking at it as that that could be balanced then you can learn to become that feeling and then it's opposite and then you balance it so that there is no longer the disharmony or uh, distortion that there was before it's a lifelong process what we're trying to do with this whole balancing thing is uh, to know ourselves and then to accept ourselves through the balancing and then to become the creator but because the creator is actually a 360 degree being that loves all things all people and we can't pick and choose what we think is a good thing or a bad thing we need to use it all as food for growth and become the creator that makes sense awesome thank you so much you're welcome thank you Thanks for the questions. Hey, uh, I wanted to note with that we are approaching the end of our hour, and I know we still have some folks who have been waiting to ask questions. I see Prashant and Crystal and Ishan and Daniel Hadap, and I do want to make sure that those folks have a chance to uh, ask their questions. If there's anyone else who's been waiting to ask a question for a while, and I didn't see your name or see your question, please feel free to let me know and uh, put it at the bottom of the chat window. Otherwise, I would like to start bringing things to a close. Uh, Prashant, would you like to ask your question? Hey, Jim, uh, very nice to see you. This is Prashant connecting from India, love and light, uh, and really fortunate to meet you on the call. Uh, so uh, this is a question regarding uh, the entities, uh, Latvi and Hatton. So we know that Ra is from uh, Venus uh, and uh, it has evolved into a sixth density. So uh, any idea of what planets uh, Latvi and Hatton are from? I have no idea. <laughs> we've never asked and we've never got that information. Just They just never have volunteered it. Uh, but you know, maybe we could ask sometime. You would think by now we would have asked that, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> we haven't asked it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, it would be nice to read about the channeling once that happens. Yeah. Somewhere Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Crystal, did you want to unmute your mic and ask a question? Thanks, Jim, for being here. Um, and uh, so, uh, fellow, before you were just answering a question that sort of pertains to uh, my question, which is about polarity. 
Um, so I, I was raised a Catholic and I think um, I'm very sensitive to the whole moralization thing. And so uh, in my mind, I think I sort of associate uh, the emphasis on polarity with a kind of a moral position. And I've been working with another channeler for some years who, who focuses, uh, he states, neutrality. And um, in fact, his higher self calls him the gray man. And so if you think of it like a fulcrum, um, neutrality to me is like being in the middle and loving everyone, uh, whereas I see the emphasis on polarization. Uh, I don't know, for some reason, I'm just having a hard time uh, with, with that there. Because um, I like the idea that we should be loving everyone equally, which I think was what you had said to the way shower. Can you talk about the, the emphasis that's being put on polarizing um, um, positively as opposed to being in some lot of a neutral position, if that makes sense? Yes, uh, I'll do my best. Um, Ra suggested that the polarization in consciousness that we are attempting to do here in the positive sense of being of service to others is uh, expressing our love for others by the way we relate to them. Now, they likened it, well, they didn't liken it, I likened it <laughs> to a car battery. If the car battery, if there is a potential difference between the positive and negative pole, the battery will start the car and the car will go. But there has to be a potential, there has to be a positive and a negative. So in our own consciousness, we're doing the same thing when we potentially uh, polarize in the conscious way so that our spiritual journey is accelerated. That way we are able to share the unconditional love in our hearts that comes to us and through us from the creator with people in the way we relate to them, the way we serve them. And any kind of service uh, is uh, uh, speaking and uh, exchanging information, uh, helping when they need a ride to the store to get groceries, um, helping uh, a neighbor who has a, a need to get the sidewalk clean of snow, like I help my neighbors uh, in the winter. Uh, anyway, is a good way of being of service. The intention of being of service and of sharing service and loving others is the important point. So basically, it's just the way we empower our spiritual journey. If we were neutral, and, and then that would seem to me to be that there we would not love anyone. Uh, it may simply be an interpretation of terms uh, that a neutrality, uh, you don't want to focus on any one more than another. And I think that's a good point. We need to be able to love everybody, including ourselves. Uh, in fact, it seems to be most effective if you do love yourself, that you can love others then. Sometimes it's hard to love somebody else if for some reason, you have this story going through your mind that you're not worthy of love. Uh, so that's my best effort of answering your question. Do you have a follow-up or? I think it could be like a semantic thing. Um, I'm not sure. Um, native language is not English. Um, but all he described uh, the way that matter came into being was about the you know, the positive and negative charges of electrons and vibration and so forth that, you know, there's this wave, right? And so uh, that, that both are needed, the positive and the negative charge in order to be able uh, to enable the physical reality. And so anyway, um, thank you for your answer. I, I think it's, um, I'm just gonna have to do a little trick in my mind and not get triggered. <laughs> well, I, I, the idea I, that there's right, you know what I mean. I think you may have uh, what could be called an overview picture that the creator would have that all entities, positive and negative, need to be loved the same 
because they all provide the ability for the creator to know itself, both positive and negative do. So I think in that respect, that overview is quite accurate. Okay, well, thank you. That that uh, clarified something. I appreciate it. Thanks for thank being you. here. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the question, Crystal. Uh, I see questions from Ishan and Andy and Ellie and Dan H. Before we wrap things up, Ishan, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Hello, Donovan. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Hi, so Jim. Much. Hi, Ishan. Long time no see. <laughs> you seem more busy nowadays. I can see the, you know, the tenseness on your forehead. <laughs> Do you have a question, Sean? <laughs> it was not here, you know, a few months I talked before. It seems you're busy nowadays a lot and getting lots of work from LL research. Indeed. Do you have a question, Sean? May, may the love and light flow and the vitality flows in the love and light and all the stress relief for you. And you be of service. <clears throat> My question, I will get on it. So my question was regarding the service to creator. So in the past days, I had not been focusing on service to creators and living in this illusory world, so to say. So I would like to know the importance of serving the creator. So as it is said by the law, like in the 25,000 year cycle, the humanity itself will evolve to the next possible stage in evolution or in the density. So what is the importance of consciously seeking the creator? And if we are not seeking the creator, and if I am engaged in this illusory aspect of reality, what I am at loss at? And if I am seeking the creator, what is the profit I am gaining? You know, like if I am sending love and I am serving the creator with love. And if we are serving, where is the most of the work done? In the space time or in the time space, subjective or objective dimension? Well, I think the value of serving the creator is that we reveal uh, more of the nature of reality to ourselves as we seek to serve the creator, the unitary nature that all of us are one. That's basically the law of one that I was talking about. So becoming able to perceive more of the nature of reality, the nature of the creator is something that enhances our spiritual journeys. That's uh, what basically Ra called the seeker of truth. What we're trying to figure out, what is the truth? Well, the truth seems to be that we're all the creator and we're here in this third density illusion to discover that. And sometimes the discovery period, uh, techniques are kind of difficult and because we have this veil of forgetting. It's not all obvious to us. And so we have to become conscious seekers of truth. And when we do become conscious of this path of seeking, then we enhance our ability to begin. And uh, Ross said stress begin to understand the nature of reality as being unitary and that love being the power of creation the light is the manifestation of creation all of these things are part of what we can do on our spiritual journey and when we don't do that then we uh, are in kind of a, a state of uh, no progress uh, sort of uh, i guess ross said that you know entities uh, of that nature uh, are within the sinkhole of indifference. They're indifferent to what life is or what it has any meaning to it. They live a life in the mundane world where they're just trying to earn enough money to support the family, live in a nice house in a good neighborhood, be well thought of, and so forth. And that is the mundane world that uh, we all are attempting to move from. It's uh, sort of the foundation upon which we build our spiritual journey to begin to see there's more to life than just doing those mundane things. So uh, our spiritual journey of serving the creator is a way that we uh, see eventually that everybody, including ourselves, is the creator. And the creator exists within all things. There's nothing but the creator. So there are ramifications that go on and on and on uh, for the next uh, few million years in the higher densities. This is an experience we begin in the third density. and. Uh, I think you're off to a good start. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I have a follow-up question after that. Like, okay. the, where is the most of the work done in the service? If I am serving the creator and I am doing activities, actions in the space-time and I am doing 
action in the time space like i am changing the configurations of the mind by some any activity meditation or any sort of thing where the most of the work needed to be done time space or space time which is the most effective way of seeking the creator i believe you're doing the work in space time but your intention of being of service to the creator takes you into time space so that the work is done in both but the greatest work of the spiritual nature is done in time space okay what kind of work is that specifically to it is orient any the work. state of experience so basically the seeking the creator is to see the unity in all of the experience and that seeing the uni unity is a type of state experience like we experience a non dualism like all of the reality is not two but a one existential reality and that state is a continuous you know it, the work is maybe like a building up of continuous state experience so to say uh if i understand your question uh the work itself can be anything the most important thing is your intention of what you desire to do and what you do doesn't matter it all occurs in time space you can you can do anything you want to help another person simply say hello take them to the store shopping you know do whatever you want with the person that is not the important thing the important thing is your intention intention to love yes thanks a lot jim so thank you i appreciate it great questions thank you so much for asking uh, Andy, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Um, yes, my question was about um, meditation and your personal experience of it. Um, when you meditate, do you get insights and, and downloads and moments of inspiration? And also, do you, how do you distinguish that from say neg negative or positive entities trying to come through in my personal meditations um, i have a technique that i use that is um, something that came from inner guidance uh, it's not necessarily something that might be helpful to other people i think we all have different ways of meditating i think the basic purpose of the meditation uh, according to Ra, is that we have an ability to make contact with the creator, the one infinite creator. And that contact can be expressed in a number of ways. Most of them are too deep for words, so that what we come away with is a feeling or an inspiration or a direction. Um, occasionally, I have gotten words and they have been most inspiring. Uh, I've never felt that there has been any negative entity there. I believe that the meditative state is a state when you enter it consciously with the intention of seeking some sort of guidance or contact with the creator or with humanity or with the concept of love or something positive like that, that there is no need or Ability of negative entities to be part of that. Awesome. <laughs> so, wait, Thank, you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful question. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, Ellie, you've been waiting to ask a question for a while. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi. Hi, Jim, again. Hi, Ellie. Nice to be here. Um, my question was, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about using tuning forks with my peeps at a, at a rehab that I volunteer at. And we have people from jails, streets, um, others wanting to get sober and clean. And my question was, I use tuning forks and Reiki on them to break the habitual energy thoughts patterns. And I want your um, input regarding this. Well, you're in two areas that I don't know anything about. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how to use tuning forks or Reiki, but I have a hunch, 
just from what I've heard that they are effective for you in doing that. And I would congratulate you for finding something that is can break the patterns of people in the uh, rehab that need to do that breaking of patterns because the pattern is the thing that keeps them in the rut, you might say, keeps in the same way of thinking and the same way of being. And they are have the equivalent of a disease that needs to, to have a, a, a solution. And you your medicine is Reiki and tuning forks. So I congratulate you. I'm sorry I can't add anything to it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to be prophetic and say, I see a light for you, Ellie. <laughs> Oh, I see a light in you, Ellie. I think you're doing a great job. Keep it up. <laughs> and I see the light in you as well. Thank you. This is great. Love you. Thank you. Oh, I love you the, too. Does Carla ever come through in your meditations to you? Uh, she has uh, in meditations and in dreams. And I've gotten some very inspirational information from her. Oh. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I, Thank I, you. I, I try to connect with her. Uh, she connects with people all over the world. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if you're able to do that. Thank you. That was a great question, Ellie. Thanks for asking. I did want to mention that I, I do recall reading at least one session where somebody asked a question about tuning forks and Quo spoke uh, a little bit about it. If you go to the LNL research uh, web page and use their search engine and just type in tuning fork, I'll bet you'll find at least one session. And I can help you with that if you need help with it. Just let me know on the Facebook. Thank you, Jonathan. Yeah, thank you for being here. It's great to see you again. Uh, Daniel Hodat, you have been waiting a really long time to ask a question, and I appreciate your patience. We're going to make yours the last question for today, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Are you there, Daniel? Are you able to uh, unmute your mic and ask? You can hear me now? Yes. Sounds yes. Great. Yes, I, hi, Jim. Uh, I have a question which was left over by our last session. Um, I was uh, referring to session 91. And it is, I would like to know from, from you uh, regarding the archetypes, what is your, your thoughts or your perspective or your explanation uh, to explain potentiator and the significator in the matter of archetypes? Could you answer the question maybe briefly? Well, uh, in the mind, we got a great deal of information about uh, all of the archetypes. So that would be where I would need to focus my answer. The potentiator is the high priestess. It's the equivalent of our unconscious mind. The high priestess has the ability to bias the catalyst that we see in our life experience so that the magician or the conscious mind goes forth in a certain way and responds to it in a certain way that can utilize catalyst that then when it is balanced provides experience and that experience then can become registered or placed within the significator so that the significator of the mind becomes that portion of the mind that has the bounty, the fruit of all of the processing of catalysts that we use in our life patterns. And the potentiator potentiates this possibility. And eventually the, the conscious mind using it, turning it into catalyst and experience, gives it over to the significator. And that is our significant self. That is the self that has all this fruit of the journey of the first four archetypes placed within it so that this significator is that that what you would probably see as the most important part of the archetypical mind regarding who we are and how we live our life what our spiritual journey is do you have a follow-up to... okay Thank you very much, Shukira. I have to think about it. I will come back to you on that one for sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, Any not a simple concept. Our archetypical mind <laughs> is going to be a long conversation. We yeah, could yeah. have a whole other session just for that. They're, they're all related. You can't mm. separate them. Indeed. Very much. Mm. Thank you for uh, asking the question. And wanted to thank everyone for being here. We have a 
larger than usual uh, group here on Zoom today, and I see uh, more than a couple of new faces. So always a joy to see you here, and I do want to encourage anyone who would like to participate in any of these Q&A session, Q sessions to uh, join our Seattle Log One Facebook page. That's where we post announcements and Zoom links for uh, future sessions. Otherwise, uh, Jim, thank you so much for, uh, again for giving all of your time and presence and your teach learnings here. And uh, it's always uh, a joy and a delight to, to be with you. Did you have any last thoughts or reflections wanted to share before we part ways for this time? Well, it's always fun to talk to you all. You all have great questions. Uh, you're so uh, advanced in spiritual seeking that uh, I don't know. I think um, maybe I could be asking you all questions too. And maybe one of these days, that's what we ought to do. Maybe <laughs> you'll come on and I'll get to ask all of you some questions because I know you've got as much information to share as I've got. I've, I've just got information that I've been working on for years. And uh, I'm glad to share it with you. I'm, I'm glad that you all enjoy it. Uh, it's a process that we're all working together on here. And uh, if you weren't here, then my part wouldn't be here either. So we're all, uh, we're, we're a group here. And I think it's, it's really good to gather together in groups and to, to, to take our, our journeys together. You know, like Ross said, those of like mind who together seek shall far more surely find. And today I'm sure we found things that uh, wouldn't have been possible had we not interacted. So uh, heart to heart, uh, I thank you with uh, all of my heart and uh, I feel your hearts and uh, I love you all. And I thank you for, being here with me today. Indeed. Right back at you, my friend. We love you very much. And we thank you so much for all you've done and all you continue to do in service to others. I uh, want to give thanks to all our friends and family at uh, LNL Research. Thanks for all they do and continue to do in, in service to others as well. Thank you for everyone who joined us on the Zoom call. It was a delight being with you. And yes, I learned a lot from uh, everyone here as well. So much appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to uh, anyone who's watching this on YouTube in the future at some other space time or time space. Much appreciate your uh, presence as well. Until next time, in the love and light of the one infinite creator, Adonai, namaste. Love you all.